and welcome the hundreds of you who are joining us online. It's really amazing to have um, seen the, the enthusiasm with which people responded to the invitation to join us today. So um, I'm going to uh, go through a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to uh, Tara Shine, ID's Chair of the Board of Trustees, and to Tom Big, ID's Director of Strategy and Learning. So on the agenda, there'll be four discussions with David this morning, moderated by four different people. And if there's time, we may be able to open up to a question or comment from participants. If so, we'll ask you to raise your virtual hand. For those of you in the room, you can raise your real hand and we'll open up the microphone. And we're going to have a short break about halfway through in an hour's time or so. And then one final thing, if you'd like to read more about David's life and work, we've published a long read profile about him on our website. Uh, many of you have contributed to it. And there are some excellent photos and videos of David in there over the years. So take a look. Uh, it's called The Urban Legend. So we're going to be celebrating the, the legend today. So thank you so much. And now I'm handing over to Tom. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, I'm standing in for our IID's director, Tom Mitchell, who uh, unfortunately has a very bad case of COVID. So my last minute substitute, but absolutely delighted to have the chance to say a few brief words at the beginning. Recognising the huge contribution David has made to IID's life over the last 50 years um, and uh, acknowledging the, the um, impact um, he's had in shaping the direction the organisation's taken. I looked in my cupboard this morning and thought I really should put on a blue denim shirt. We had a joke in IID that David would open his wardrobe and there'd be nothing but a full row of blue denim shirts in there. So I see you're so keeping true. up. <laughs> um, don't forget the blue denim suit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever saw that one. But that was almost, a, for, for me, an example of David's kind of consistency, that he's uh, stuck at an agenda for 50 years and shaped within IID a hugely influential body of work and obviously built connections globally and had huge impact globally as this fantastic report documents. Um, just to pick up a few of the things that are particularly relevant for IID's growth over those, over those 50 years, I think David's shown huge prescience and judgment in some of the some of the the, the work he's shaped, starting with the, the the focus that I think is consistent through all of that period on listening to, respecting, and learning from grassroots actors and communities, and finding ways to do that that also connected with audiences at national and international level in a way that I think is was truly groundbreaking and is still hugely influential. Um, I think the anticipation of the the value of having a, a, a journal, an academically refereed journal on environment and urbanization, again, um, building on, as, as this document says, the, the work of Jorge Ardoy, but um, taking that to uh, really diverse audiences and again, consistently generating it over decades in a way that's hugely impressive with Sheridan and others. Um, anticipating the significance of impact of climate for cities and urban populations, I think in a way that, um, again, David stuck with over many years, but that probably has been influential in the, the fact the IPCC will have a special report on cities and the framing for that, I think has been very influenced by work David's done with others. And perhaps most of all, prescience and judgment in the partnerships and alliances David has built with individuals, with organizations, which have lasted over decades <laughs> and which I think are the bedrock of many of the relationships that IED now has with communities and, uh, and networks and organizations around the world. Um, and the trust and sort of faith David's placed in the, those relationships. I remember, for example, David saying at one point, if I ruled the world, I would make some sort of Punya Bancha the prime minister and uh, I trust her judgment to, uh, uh, to solve so many of the, the problems the world faces. But that sort of sense that um, of trust and faith in the judgment of others, I think, is, has been a really strong characteristic. And many of those um, strengths uh, are also evident in the, the, range, the number of students of David's over many years who are now ID employees, ID associates, ID collaborators. Again, a sort of rich growing network around the world. Um, a few just quick reflections on the sort of imprint on IID's DNA David has had. That sort of focus on local to global, which is more than just a, a snapshot, a catchphrase. It's genuinely about understanding and giving voice and, and learning from grassroots organizations, but bringing that into other arenas is part of our, our DNA. The commitment to rigorous research 
that takes in a broader spectrum of knowledge than other organizations do and, and finds ways in which that's a, an integral part of recognized knowledge and expertise that uh, influences policy and practice and working collaboratively, building those long-term relationships uh, that are the bedrock for effective collaboration over over decades. All of those things, I think, are evident in what IED aspires to be. It may not always live up to it, but um, and David's played a huge role in shaping those. So delighted to be at this event. Um, thank you, Tom. And do you, do you want to correct him, David? A very quick comment. <laughs> Some Sun was to be president, Sheila was to be prime minister. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what a combination, what a combination. <laughs> um, and David, I just wanted to add, I guess, on behalf of the, the board of trustees of IIED that, you know, we're all so glad to be part of this celebration. But we also hold very dear the, the legacy that you entrust us with, those that went before us in IIED that started this endeavor in 1972, the year I was only, I was only born that year. Um, and so I really feel that we have a, a responsibility to continue on the, the great work that, that's been started by you and Barbara Ward and so many others right at the beginning. And that this interconnectedness of the issues that tie people and our beautiful earth together remain at the heart of what we do. And I guess all I can say is that although in the last year we have thrown things up in the air and redesigned uh, IIED's strategy and approach, that is just to be fit for purpose for the next 50 years, but without losing the core values and mission that I think we all hold, hold so dear. And you reminded me earlier today, David, that those are things we should, we should never lose, that we should always listen more than we talk. Um, that we should have climate at the heart of everything we do, that we have to keep a focus on urban places and urban people in, in the work that we do, and that we constantly see the interconnectedness of all of these things. That is what we bring uh, especially to the table. So on behalf of all, all the trustees present and past over all those years, um, we will uh, continue to uh, keep this legacy and grow it over the next 50 years. I won't be around for all of those 50. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Tara, and thanks, Tom. And I'm pleased enough to tell you that both the President and the Prime Minister of the world will be speaking today. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, I'm, it's back to me for our first session, which is all about generating new urban research agendas. And as I mentioned, um, I'm director of the Human Settlements Group at IID, but I'm not the only director of settlements, Human Settlements Group in the room or online. There's, there's an awful lot of us around. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to hear from quite a few of them today. So David Sasswick himself was once upon a time director of the Human Settlements Group, uh, and he established the group in the late 1970s with Rochiaard Boy. And when I joined IID about five years ago, I was really very proud to have joined an institute that has hosted so many people that have made incredible contributions to debates and scholarship on urban poverty, urban rural linkages, urbanization in general, and informality, of course. And we're going to hear now from three people who've worked with David over many decades at IID. So first, we're going to hear a recording from Diana Mitlin, who is sadly not able to join us in person. She is a former director of the Human Settlements Group and now an IID associate. And she's also a professor of global urbanism at the University of Manchester. After that, we're going to turn to Cecilia Tacconi, former director of the Human Settlements Group and now IID associate. And also from Sherry, uh, Sheridan Bartlett, who has been both a collaborator of David's uh, on a number of key publications and is co-editor of Environment and Urbanization, which is widely known to be the world's best journal. <laughs> so um, I'm going to now ask uh, that we get the recording from Diana. Good morning, everyone. I'm so sorry not to be with you in person. A long arranged holiday kept, has kept me from London. But I'm delighted to be able to at least record this message. So I wanted to just say a few things that seem important to me to recognise. One is that David is in many ways ahead of his time. I think we have to recognise the depth of his respect for urban scholarship from the global south. That was inculcated, I think, through his relationship with Jorge Hadoy, the well-known uh, Argentina, Argentinian urbanist, but it was something David completely embraced. When I started working with him in the late 80s, he was involved in preparing Shelter Need and Response, which drew on a number of case studies to highlight the work that was going on across countries to address housing needs. 
That was a time when he had very close working relationships with a Nigerian sociologist, Tadi Akinena, also with people such as Anil Agawal Sunita Narayan at the Centre for Science and Environment in India. That kind of deep collaboration has now become popular in the context of decolonization and Black Lives Matter, but it was very present, it was very much part of the debates at that time, but it was ignored by many, but it was not ignored by David. Now that's become more commonplace, it's frequent that people are hesitant about understanding their contribution, that is people in the global north who query what space there is for them to be active and add value to processes that are ongoing in the global south and should rightly be led from the global south. But David embraced his, um, his position and thought about his positionality and what he could add in a multiplicity of ways. Much of the morning is going to be spent elaborating some of that work, but there are two things I think that the programme perhaps isn't going to address that I really wanted to highlight. One is that David was deeply committed to work on urban history. He acknowledged that this was not his primary um, activity, but it was a long-standing interest. One of the things that he could pick up um, in this later stages of his working life through a blog series, the Urban Transitions blog series, and I think it's really notable how the most widely read blog, over 100,000 reads in that series, addresses the question of what are the world's fastest growing cities. And in that analysis, David goes way back to centuries of data to understand the process of urban transition. But the blog series does much more than just that. It doesn't just appeal to the things that might be of common interest beyond academia or beyond the people who are primarily concerned with improving the living conditions in southern towns and cities. He also produced a range of other blogs or catalyzed authors to produce a range of other blogs that look at things such as what is the citizen contribution, how people could respond to COVID, how, what can we do in the face of climate change? And as he's, as he's tried to put through those pages, what is the voice of, of the Global South and the Global North to address critical pressing issues of our time? Another theme that won't be given so much attention this morning, but is really critical to David's contribution is his work on urban health, which underpinned his concern for environmental issues in the Global South. So for David, the environment was not um, simply something that was heading to ecological disaster, but something that pressed on the real life challenges that people face. In his volume, edited volume, The Poor Die Young, which he did with Sandy Kangross in 1990, he really tried to elaborate why that title matters. What is it in the living conditions that creates such challenges, such health challenges, that mean indeed the title is correct? Low-income residents of cities die younger than others. That is now commonplace, but when David and Sandy edited the book, it really was very innovative. In common with all his work, he went on to do so much more than simply um, synthesise research. He went on to produce Our Planet, Our Health with the World Health Organisation that articulated a reason why health mattered, why we have to address the needs of people living in towns and cities and why their living conditions are simply appalling and unacceptable. He also, of course, brought that work into climate change and you're going to hear a lot more about this. So I, I think it, it's very hard to draw from David's work and think about what it offers because it is so complex, because he has done so many things in so many different areas that really take us forward. I hope you're really going to enjoy the rest of the morning. I know you're going to spend a little bit more time talking about environment and urbanisation, which I haven't mentioned, but which has really been critical to David's contribution. Also his work on in, in, uh, with Development Planning Unit and other ways in which he's reached out to junior scholars, his work on the IPCC, and finally, the work he's done to really create a platform to enable the voice of people living in the Global South, particularly, but not exclusively, around those working with Shack Slum Dwellers International and the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights. So please, I hope you enjoy the morning, and I'm so sorry not to be with you in person. So, having heard from Diana, I'm going to give the floor to Cecilia, to talk about David as Minister of 
Thank you. Um, I think one thing which I think is important to recognize, at least for me, is that compared to 10 years ago, there is now so much interest and acknowledgement of the importance of the urban dimension. Uh, this wasn't the case until quite recently, and it's now quite surprisingly even international agencies which are traditionally the, the rural ones, like FAO, are now more and more interested in recognizing that this is something, that the urban dimension is something which needs to be taken into account. And uh, uh, of course, David has been one of the creators of this field of knowledge. I wanted to just focus on one part of uh, which for me has been very important of David's contribution, which is asking the right questions and questioning the prevailing assumptions. Um, there is a paper which came out almost a quarter of a century ago. I think, Sherry, you edited it uh, for the journal. It was, I think, 2003. And uh, it was the ten and a half myths of uh, that urban, uh, about urban development that national and international agencies uh, have and uh, which create actually misunderstandings and mistakes in, in initiatives. So I wanted to go quickly through them because I think to some extent some of them have been opened up and unpacked. Some of them are still with us. So the work that David has been doing for the last quarter of a century, the last 50 years, it's still work in progress in a way. So uh, there are five broad headings of this myth. One is about the links between economic change and uh, urban change. Uh, the, the idea at the time was that cities are very much parasitic. We now have two blogs, actually three, one is a double blog in David series, which deal directly with this. Uh, and uh, I think there's a very interesting one on China by Li Qingli, which says, well, there has been an effort in China to uh, push for urbanization to promote economic growth. This is at the expense of uh, the lower income population, especially the migrants. So a broader understanding of how this dynamics work is really important. And it's usually very much overlooked. The second one, I think, is uh, how do we measure urban change? What is the scale of urban change? As Diana mentioned, the, one of the most uh, viewed blogs is the one on uh, the, the mega cities and uh, what are the fastest growing cities. I think it is important, very often when we read reports which deal with urbanization, it start, they start with half the world population living in urban centers. Right. Is it right? Uh, much of this comes from uh, UN data, which the UN data states very clearly, comes from projections of projections of projections in countries where censuses have been, not been done for decades. So do not take all this data at face value. I think this is really important. It's important at the time when there is also a push to use different ways of measuring, for example, density. These are um, measurements which have been developed in Europe. They do not work in other regions. They really bring misunderstandings, which then have an impact on how resources are allocated. The third big heading is uh, rural versus urban. The debate at the time, so we're talking a long time ago, it was, uh, is uh, rural poverty more important than urban poverty? Is rural development going to be um, at, the expense, at the expense of uh, urban development? Or if, if resources go into urban development, what will happen? There will be less resources for rural development, which instead should be the priority. I think that what has changed dramatically, still maybe not enough, is a different understanding of poverty. So what used to be just comparing incomes, now we know that it's not just incomes, you know, it's basic infrastructure, it's uh, the, the environmental conditions, uh, the, the risks and hazards and so on. So there is progress there, needs to be continued progress. Um, there is also uh, the, the importance of the links between uh, uh, poverty and environmental degradation and urbanization and environmental degradation 
uh, at the time the debate was very much you know the poor are polluters and cities are really <coughs> big polluters now cities are also the solution in many ways so the, the, the conversation has moved on but I think that to a large extent there is still a need to keep it as work in progress so the last point is which was very much addressing the audience for that paper. What, what should national strategies and international agencies do? And the answer was very much well, listen to the local level and listen to what <coughs> local knowledge is there and that the experience of local researchers who can document the needs and priorities of uh, local communities. Now, this links very much to the journal. The journal was the place where then all this took place, where the, this documentation started to build up and build up to such an extent that it could change the debates in the way that I think they have changed uh, throughout the years. So I will pass on to Sherry to talk about that. Okay. Thank you, Cecilia, for a great segue into this, <coughs> which is arguably, I think, one of David's most far reaching radical contributions. Um, I've been involved in that um, for 30 years, but for 35 years, it's really been busting all those myths. And it's been great to be involved for as long as I have been. Um, I met David in the early 90s at a, one of those celebratory events for an, uh, to open a UNICEF effort. And I noticed this um, wild red-haired urban expert literally chewing on a stair railing out of utter boredom. So we escaped to get some real food and have really never looked back. And a few years later, when I had to be in London for a year, David blithely offered me a desk at IID. I'm not sure he was authorized to do that, but <laughs> that was sort of the way he operated. And before I knew what was happening, I was deeply involved in the journal, not because I knew anything about its focus, my field was children, but because of David's incredible faith in anyone he perceived as a fellow traveler. I bring that up just because it's so typical. Um, David's faith and commitment and loyalty to the people and ideas and aspirations he believes in are really what has fueled the journal, which runs on an ethos of generosity and inclusion. I think journals are usually, uh, their importance is usually judged based on impact factor, which is sort of an algorithm having to do with how often papers published in the journal are cited in other peer reviewed journals. Um, we come in at number 15 out of 77 urban journals, um, much lower than David thinks we ought to be, but really quite respectable and evidence of our, you know, the robustness of our theoretical contribution and just the general seriousness of the enterprise. But what the impact factor doesn't measure is almost everything that David considered important um, in, in founding the journal. First of all, it's widely read by non-academics who are unlikely to cite it anywhere, but um, whose practical work is deeply influenced by what they read in the journal. Uh, it also overlooks thousands of students. David really designed the journal to be a teaching tool for poorly researched universities in the global south. and. Um, the way it's designed around special issues on particular themes is a format that really lends itself to classroom use. And this was especially important back when online access was more difficult. And there have been many teachers who've told David that um, ENU is the only journal they read. Um, that was made possible by his commitment to providing free subscriptions to the Global South, to institutions, and NGOs, and universities. Um, and David was so committed to this that he avoided formal academic publishers for the journal. And instead, because he was afraid it would undermine that policy, and instead he would 
glue thousands of address labels onto thousands of journals and send them off in the mail. But finally, Sage came calling and um, agreed to David's insistence that this policy be maintained. Another really important thing that the impact factor doesn't measure is not just who reads the journal, but who writes for it. Um, David's always welcomed papers by practitioners whose work would not be considered by any academic journal. Uh, it, we also have an incredible track record on publishing the work of women and people from the global south. Um, a recent list of our top 20 downloaded papers shows that more than half are by authors or co-authors from the south and all but two papers have women authors. Um, most important perhaps to David's vision has been the community voices that are featured in the journal, which was really designed in part as a platform for the work of urban federations, grassroots groups, other community-based organizations to document um, the amazing work they do to address the lives of people in urban poverty. And um, <clears throat> it's really an acknowledgement of it's an eye opener for people who are considering um, the appropriate responses to urban poverty. It opens the eyes of the development world and it acknowledges the, their contribution to academic debates. I think I'm out of time and um, we'll pass you on to all these other aspects of David's career, but bear in mind that the journal has been um, a companion in all of those enterprises, and that most of the people who are going to speak have probably published in ENU. So. Thank you so much, Terry, and to Cecilia. Um, and it's really remarkable how people talk about publishing in ENU, how it's the, one of the most um, fruitful and productive experiences they've had. So often writing for a peer reviewed journal is just really painful. <laughs> um, but being able to work with David, with Diana uh, and Sherry, and also I know that Cecilia has also worked on many special issues. People talk about it being a real joy and, um, uh, and helping to get their, their message across in, in language that is clear um, and accessible to this huge global audience. Um, so we are almost out of time for this session. Um, so unless anybody in the room wants to jump in or comment, um, I will be handing over, unless David wants to, to respond to what you've heard so far this morning. There's many more opportunities to, to jump in. Only the, some of the innovation that's described to me is actually due to them. In, I suppose, Next year, can we do the other legends of human suffering? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Although we are, I think we all are also celebrating other people's contributions, and very much as this is a, a a kind of a joint, a joint celebration of of your collaborations, David. That's how we, yeah. we're pitching it. Um. So, thank you again to to um my my panelists. Um. And remember, if you'd like to talk about your experience of publishing at ENU, you can do that in the chat, or you can write to us about it. Um, and I now have the pleasure of handing over to my colleague, um, Alexandri Apsanfrediani, otherwise known as Alex, um, and he'll be leading the next session on shaping generations of urban practitioners. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, well, what's fantastic to join uh, this event uh, here online. Sorry not to be in person with you. I had a bit of a flu, and I thought I oh, better not, uh, not show up uh, in Wimbledon. But uh, it's great to be part of this conversation. And uh, yeah, th this session is going to really focus on the role that uh, David's work and ethics has played in inspiring generations of urban development practitioners. Me being just one among uh, a whole bunch of people that are here today and uh, and sharing enthusiastic comments. You can see some here on the Zoom chat. Uh, Alan from Development Workshop in Angola, Anika at the University of York, uh, Daoji that saved the children, Rock. Roxana uh, at WRI and, and so on. So many, many interesting and fascinating testimonials of the role that David played in inspiring them uh, throughout their 
education, learning journey, professional development, uh, influencing their hearts and their minds. So today we're going to hear from uh, uh, some, some of those that have been part of this journey that, uh, that saw David in action in different ways. And we're going to hear the testimonials, the accounts of, uh, of, of seeing and being with David or reading David in, uh, in those learning journeys of inspiration and of hope. Uh, we're going to start with Pascal Hoffman, which is an associate professor at the Development Planning Unit. And uh, yeah, I'm passing over to Pascal. Please join your, your insights, Pascal. Uh, thank you, Alex. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Alex said, I'm based at the Development Planning Unit, where I co-lead the Masters in Environment and Sustainable Development, or ESD for short. Um, I've known David for more than 20 years, and I've been invited to talk about David's contribution to shaping development practitioners, particularly through his engagement in teaching. So very briefly, for those that are not quite familiar with the DPU, although it's nice to see quite a few colleagues and alumni among those attending the event, the DPU is a UCL department within the Bartlett Faculty of the built environment, and we undertake cutting edge research, teaching, and advisory services with the overall aim to strengthen capacity towards socially just and sustainable development in the global south. Our seven master's programs are geared towards early to mid career professionals from all over the world with various disciplinary backgrounds. So it probably doesn't come as a surprise that David's work features heavily in the syllabus of many of our modules. But his most substantial involvement in teaching at the DPU has been within the ESD Masters. This is a Masters that was launched in 1997 under the direction of my colleague Adriana, and Ellen, Adriana Allen. And it builds upon a series of short courses focused on environmental planning and management that the DPU provided and is aimed at bridging theory and practice to address the world's most pressing social environmental challenges in the context of climate change and uncertainty. So obviously David has been very well placed to contribute and he joined the team shortly after ESD's inception to lead a module on the critical examination of environmental problems in urban areas of the global south placing particular emphasis on the lives of ordinary citizens and how they are affected, while also examining the underlying political causes. Having been one of David's students myself, I can clearly attest to his ability to convey complex issues in an accessible way, and he expected the same from his students. So for example, one of the assignments involved preparing a city profile that evidences a city's environmental problems in a way that is not overly academic or technical to convince the mayor to take action. Over the years, he inspired hundreds of international students, challenging the assumptions of many and debunking common myths about poverty and the environment in urban areas. He used the teaching space to bring his work in practice into the classroom by also sharing numerous anecdotes and funny stories. And this was, a, was key to keeping the module current and also allowed sharing examples of new and quite innovative approaches and solution, solutions. Most notably is probably the value of his long-standing engagement with grassroots organizations across the Global South and this provided rich empirical evidence from marginalized groups and their initiatives and clearly challenged mainstream thinking. David also increasingly incorporated insights from his longstanding engagement with the IPCC and his efforts to urbanize the climate agenda, which eventually led to, ded to a dedicated module on adapting cities to climate change that he co-developed co with David Dotman. After I had the pleasure of being taught by David, I've worked with him for many years within the ESD Masters in different roles. Like probably many others over the years, David, um, David has really um, inspired my way of thinking and instilled in me 
the need for disaggregated data and analysis, and the importance of grassroots knowledge and action. Dear David, you might have stepped back from teaching a few years ago, but I would like you to know that together with Don, who will speak after me in this panel, we are upholding your legacy and you continue to feature prominently within the module that you use to teach, whether it is in the readings, through pre-recorded inputs, or your research and practice-based teaching. So I want to close by thanking you for your guidance, for your inspiration, and for your friendship over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. That's a, that's great, wonderful input. Uh, and uh, as you already start uh, describing, there are so many wonderful devices that uh, David has used in the classroom, which has been part of our conversations in preparation to to this uh, exchange. And Dom, I, Dom Brown, who is uh, uh, also a lecturer at the DPU, as uh, is associate professor, and he has been taking a lot of the of the work forward of of David. Uh, Dom, do you want to share a few a few words with us about some of those devices, mechanisms, the pedagogical practices that uh, that I think David uh, used so effectively in the classroom? Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hello, David. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be part uh, of this panel. So, there. Uh, thank you very much for for the invitation. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't actually. That my profile pic has a bunch of E and U. Um, issues in the background. Um, so it just goes to show how much a, of an influence ENU has had had on me. Um, so as uh, Alex mentioned, my name is Donald Brown. Um, and alongside Pascal, literally in this case, I, I'm an associate professor here at the, the DPU. Uh, it's really great to see so many faces in the room, um, including some of uh, David's former students, myself and Pascal um, uh, included. So as a DPU student back in 2011, 2012, I took uh, David's module called Adapting Cities to Climate Change, which was co-led with David Dobbin um, at the time. Affectionately known as David S and David D, the so-called Davids, they co-established the module in 2009, a year before David S became involved in co-leading the first urban chapter in the fifth, fifth assessment report of the IPCC, which was later published in 2014. It was David's work on the urbanization of risk that led me in large part to, to the DPU, having worked in Malawi for quite some time. So I was really thrilled uh, to be one of his students. So today I've been asked to speak a little bit about David's teaching style um, and approach. I can speak to this topic from two perspectives. First, as his former student, as mentioned, and second, as a module tutor between 2018 and 2021, when David and I co-led a core module in the MSC ESD uh, in the, the DPU. So as his former student, um, I was immediately impressed with his uncanny ability to distill complex uh, complexity into simplicity without losing the nuances. I'm sure I won't be the only person to make this observation today. In fact, Pascal already um, has. What also struck me um, was uh, David's use of detailed case studies, many published in ENU, which, uh, as David likes to say, is the world's best journal. So as a trained urban planner myself, um, I was educated based on northern theories and practices, many deemed to be universally valid, regardless of local circumstances. So engaging with detailed case studies as examples, uh, in this case of urban climate risk at different scales from the individual household neighborhood to the citywide level, allowed me and my fellow students to learn firsthand from diverse experiences on the ground. For one of our pieces of coursework, David S. and David D. Um, had the class apply the criteria used by the IPCC to assess the rigor of publications used in each chapter. In doing so, they combined an academic and practical exercise while exposing us to the inner workings of the IPC's scientific uh, process. This exercise to me reflects the very practical and applied nature uh, of David's uh, teaching uh, approach. As David's a colleague, we co-taught a DPU module called Urban Environmental Planning and Management in Development for four years beginning in 2018 when I first joined uh, the DPU. What has changed over time is a considerable growth of scholarship on climate change in cities, due in part to David's decision as a former editor of ENU to include a section dedicated to, to this uh, increasingly important topic 
and each issue of the journal beginning back in 2006. This has enabled Pascal and I, who now run the module, to strengthen and expand David's case-based uh, teaching approach by drawing on a range of towns and cities in different parts of the world, so as to, to explore the importance of local context and to challenge a number of urban myths um, and misconceptions. Pascal and I have retained other aspects of David's teaching approach. Each year, David began the term with a short questionnaire asking the students to define different environmental terms. David used the questionnaire as an ice-breaking exercise to test the students' knowledge while eliciting some very humorous responses that David would share in class. Over the years, we have received some pretty funny ones. So notably, one student thought that PM10, a type of fine particulate matter air pollutant, was Prime Minister Number 10 Downing Street. The questionnaire <laughs> continues to provide an opportunity to connect with the students in a lighthearted fashion while getting a sense of how much we need to do um, as module tutors. Fortunately, owing to the pedagogical, pedagogical innovations involving hybrid learning that we developed during the pandemic, David continues to provide substantive inputs into the curricula through a series of pre-recorded lectures. So David is still intimately part of the learning experience, both as a guest lecturer as, as, and as a key author uh, throughout um, the reading list. On a more personal note, uh, David has been a pleasure working closely with you over the years. More importantly, though, it's been an uh, even bigger pleasure uh, being your friend. Uh, to IID, thank you again for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Don. Um, yeah, fantastic to, to hear all this, uh, all this practices and, and yeah, and the mechanisms through which uh, he has been able to inspire so many of us in the classroom. But another way through which uh, um, David has been very, very much influencing um, the pedagogical journey of so many is through this, the, his support and his role in the setting up of new uh, international institutes uh, focused on, on urban issues. And the Indian Institute for Human Settlements is one of those that had a, a radical and ambitious pedagogical project uh, that's based in, in Bangalore. And Gautam Ban is here with us. He's uh, uh, at present uh, the dean the Associate Dean of IHS School of Human Development, as well as Senior Lead of Academics and Research in IHS. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Gautam, to be here with us. Please uh, share your reflections. Hi, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here today. I think, um, you know, one of my favorite things about David is actually how, uh, how invested he is in being happy. Uh, there's a certain sense of joy that you need to hold on to if you're going to pick the kind of fights that he picked. Um, and I have a sense that he's really enjoying this. And I think that's the kind of celebration that you want to have. Um, and it's the kind of space that he made for so many of us when we were starting out is to also say every once in a while, stop and just sort of, even if in, you're in the middle of the most intractable fight, just give thanks that at least you're in it. You're moving, you're trying something, you're doing something. And, you know, when I hear the story of how ENU began with something and became something. Everything begins with something and becomes something. But there's a lot of joy that gets you through. Um, and it gets you through it when you're not able to see the results immediately. And I think there's a spirit in David's work. And you can sense it in his scholarship. But as a teacher, it's actually been one of the things that I we all try to hold on to, to the students in our classrooms. That it's not going to come immediately and it's not going to come easily. But it something, something will come in your hand at some point. And every once in a while, there's a small voice in my head when I'm trying to convince someone to kind of keep in it. I sort of in my head have David as a person who I have seen keep at it for so long in so many ways. So it's an odd pedagogical legacy, but but joy is actually very much a pedagogical object. And I think it may be the most primary one. Um, but more traditionally pedagogically, there's two things I wanted to say that I think really comes from David's work. I think the first thing is an insistence on writing. And it's an insistence on writing that is not separate from the acts of doing. Um, there is so much that people know because of the lives they live that we never get to read. And I think it's 
very tempting for practitioners sometimes, particularly to kind of take the doing as being somehow more important than the thinking or the writing. And David's refusal to separate doing and writing, um, and then his opening of the act of writing to come in any form, any register, any complexity, impact factor or not, um, I think is a really wonderful legacy um, for pedagogy and for teaching. The second thing I wanted to say was that I think that David has an extraordinary ability to take long-term abstract thinking and short-term pragmatic thinking equally seriously. Um, and I think many of us get stuck in this sense of saying our knowledge should feel urgent and relevant and applied. Um, and therefore, you lose the ability to step back and think reflectively over a period of time. And then the counter of that, which is that you think abstractly and theoretically, but you don't hold yourself accountable to the world into which those concepts must go in. And I think that David was someone in my own experience of writing in ENU, uh, my own experience of engaging with him, my own experience of teaching his work. The range of his own work shows you that there are moments where he settles into open-ended questions that have no closed answers meant to be asked over years and there are moments where like get your shit together this is what we have to do let's get it down let's document it let's put it down let's make it move and I think so often we get paralyzed between these temporalities in which knowledge and research flow and David had an ability to say you can do both maybe not at the same time but over a period of time you can do both and you need to do both at different times and i think that it was a very powerful lesson for me but is also a lesson i try to pass on to my students is not to pit abstract theoretical conceptualization against applied pragmatic useful knowledge not to allow these false dichotomies not to not to pitch ourselves against each other um, but to allow yourself to read and think in different ways and the last thing I think that for me was very important as a teacher from David's work is that very often when people write from a very strong normative position, a set of beliefs, a set of values, a set of ethical principles, you, in the academy particularly, that can be wielded against you as an accusation. It's propaganda, it's a polemic, it's a manuscript, it's a manifesto, it's not a reflection, it's not complex. And I think that in a lot of David's work, you see the fact that beginning from a normative location doesn't imply any lack of rigor, um, that it doesn't imply any lack of complexity. But that does not mean that you also then hold to this idea that you cannot begin as a researcher, a teacher, an academic with a very strong sense of values. Um, and putting those different things together, um, I think of all of these as certain sensibilities that are in our class room beyond what we teach um, and in my mind uh, and particularly today David um, it is a pleasure to be able to tell you that you have given us these sensibilities for so many years full for it you Gautam thank you so much and uh, I, I love the image of of David in the back of your mind while, while you're teaching reminding you to stick with it uh, I think that's a fantastic I think uh, I think some of us also see David there uh, in, in our own engagement every so often. And another thing that uh, David uh, understood very well is that uh, those learning journeys of uh, professional development does not only take place within classrooms of higher education, but actually within local governments, uh, institutions, uh, and networks of local and regional governments. Uh, and uh, I think his, his long-standing relationship with uh, UCLG and the research team of the UCLG actually shows that that commitment that he had about for learning uh, in, within very different sites. We're going to be hearing in the next session also around uh, his engagement with grassroots uh, uh, organizations and networks. But uh, uh, for now, let's let's hear Edgardo Bilski that has been the director of research at UCIG for many years and collaborated with David for so many years. And I had the pleasure also to work closely with Edgardo recently. Edgardo, it's a great pleasure to have you here in the panel and to hear your, your inputs. Thank you very much, Alex. Hi, David. It is a pleasure, really a pleasure to see you again. Uh, I think we collaborate uh, for almost more than 10 years uh, with key different moments. And I say personally, for me, it was not only, a great, not only a great pleasure, but a source of extraordinary learning. And I think that I speak not only for myself, but also for my colleagues of UCLG. I would like to take a quick tour 
through this experience. Our first collaboration with you was as coordinator uh, of the third UCLG Global Report on Local Democracy and Decentralization, Goal 3, on Basic Service for All, between 2012 to 2014. It was a very demanding process. This report was an attempt to present, for the first time, a global view of the situation of local public services managed by local governments in the different regions of the world. The report addressed the situation in access to drinking water and sanitation, solid waste, public transport, and in some cases, electricity, their links to urban governance, financing, housing, health, climate, local democracy. At that time, Thanks to your coordination, we reached to mobilize more than 25 experts and many other contributors. I remember the debates we had on access issues, the treatment of statistics, as well as the management and financing models. Your role in the coordination meeting was key to bringing positions closer together and facilitating the final drafting of the report. This coincided with the publication of the report in which you also participate as co-coordinator of the working group two of the fifth assessment of the IPCC, Climate Change 2014, Impact, Adaptation and Vulnerability, with a section on urban areas that highlighted the role of local government in scanning up adaptation and in managing risk and financing. As well as being the first global report of these kinds, these publications came at a key moment as the president of UCLG was invited in 2013 to join the high-level panel of eminent personalities on the post-2015 agenda. Your contributions were essential to the notes that we prepared at that time as inputs for the panel. I remember in particular your 2015 intervention on urban data revolution for the post-2015 agenda. Thanks to your contribution, Together with, with the coalition that was formed at this time, we succeed to substantiate the inclusion of the urban SDG, SDG 11 in the new agenda. From then on, our collaboration continued on a regular basis. You contribute on the time to the Goal Force Report, which defined the vision and agenda of the local government for the Habitat 3 Summit. Subsequently, you support us in the 2017 mobilization on the coalition on the right to housing, which brought together an international group of mayors, Barcelona, Paris, Montevideo, Johannesburg, among others. And with the UN commissioner on the right to housing at this time, Leilani Farah. The initiative resulted in a manifesto signed by more than 50 big cities presented at the UN and a publication in 2019 with you again coordinated rethinking housing policies with data and case studies in almost all countries, all continents, sorry, more than 25 cities, with the aim to build the institutional and financial capacities of local governments to act and respond to housing crisis and contribute to reach the new urban agenda and SDGs. More recently, you again contribute to the Goal 6 report in 2022, coordinated by DPU UCL with a paper on upgrading basic services provision in informal settlements, city-led, community-led, and common. Your contribution highlights the mutual advantage of a partnership between communities and local governments to respond to the needs of and rights of the most deprived population and better link issues of access to urban policies and governance. Dear David, our collaboration has been a very enriching process for our network and lo of local governments, and through it, I think, for local governments as a whole. Also, that I have retired this year. I believe that the knowledge and analysis to which you have contributed has been and will remain an enduring testimony of uh, your work and for the importance of collaboration between local governments, experts, and academics, as well as the need to close a partnership between communities, local governments at local, national, and international level. Let me express a big thank for your commitment and friendship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edgardo. And uh, yeah, wonderful testimonial from 
you personally, from how meaningful it has been, as I know, this relationship, but also for the wider network of local and regional governments. Uh, thank you all for your inputs and testimonials. It's been uh, a very enriching uh, set of inputs. Uh, and I will pass it over to Lucy in the room there with David and others. Thank you, Alex and, and colleagues. Uh, before we go to a short break, I just wondered if anyone in the room wanted to jump in there and, and if David wants to, to respond. Or any other, um, any comments in the room? This is <clears throat> Finally, people have got the importance of local data and no report is complete without the reference to this. And yet the statistical offices are not changing. Um, one of the documents I learned most from was done by Shackwellers International working in Kisumu in Kenya. And I'm reminded of the fact that this has a level of detail that actually exceeds many of the official documentation. For instance, on sanitation, there's nine questions. The other thing that's remarkable about them is that if the Federation thinks they're going to get upgrading, they do every house, every house, like a census, not a sample. I remember being in South Africa some years ago where they were developing their upgrading program and they asked me any advice. I said, well, what are you going to do about sampling? He said, what sampling? I said, well, it's easier to cover the cost if you only do one house on in four. They said, we want to talk to every house on it. So you get a completely different perspective on local information. And I, in a sense, the next stage for me is to get this understood as a working methodology controlled and managed by the STI or another community group and pull us away from arguments about how good aerial data or satellite data is. Thank you, David, and we'll have the opportunity to talk more about SDI and other grassroots groups after the break. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be back at five minutes past the hour. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to be um, showing some pictures uh, and um, some testimonials from, from friends and colleagues online. And um, we'll see you back very shortly. Welcome back to our event celebrating the career of David Satterthwaite. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to David Dorman for our next session on working with the IPCC. David Dorman, yet another former director of the Human Settlements Group. Great. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, before we begin this, I'll introduce the three other panellists. I am um, trying to think of ways in which they might like to be introduced, so I hope I've done a fair job. Um, Deborah Roberts will be with us. I'd say Deborah is a proud local government practitioner, um, a professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands and a former co-chair for the IPCC's Working Group 2. Mark Pelling, um, Professor of Risk and Disaster Reduction at um, UCL, um, and my colleague um, as an urban coordinating lead author for the IPCC in the IPCC sixth assessment. Um, and um, Arama Revi, the director of the Indi Indian Institute for Human Settlements, uh, a co coordinating lead author with David on the IPCC fifth mm -hmm. assessment, and I guess an an urban provocateur at large, I think I would say for um, Arama. I know Arama has some connection problems, so hopefully he'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to hear from him. And I think it's also wonderful to see the names that have been popping up in the chat. I mean, we've been, if you've seen us squinting at the screen, it's because it's been really lovely to see the names of people who are, uh, who are involved in the discussion. Um, and with a bit of luck, we'll have some time for, for inputs um, from our online participants as well. As has been mentioned, cities are now central in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC process, including um, in the upcoming seventh assessment report cycle. Um, just last month, we had a scoping meeting for the first ever special report on um, cities and climate change. Um, and I was lucky enough to be there. And in the opening session, and Deborah will be able to vouch for this as well, 
I think the only individual name mentioned from the floor as being an inspiration for where we had got to was David's name. And it, um, I don't think it came from anyone who's been one of the speakers here. I mean, it's just uh, somebody from a much wider um, community. So I think that's really um, significant. David was first involved in the IPCC third assessment report, which was published in 2001. And the chapter in 2001 on human settlements, energy and industry had 36 pages and the bibliography was five pages long. When Mark, Bronwyn, Hayward and myself were working on the um, equivalent chapter in the sixth assessment, the chapter was 145 pages long with 43 pages of references. And I say this not to suggest that David had an easier job assessing a smaller literature back in 2001, but to make the point that we had so much more literature to engage with, in large part due to the influence of David and others who promoted, engaged um, and wrote a huge amount of the material that we were able to, um, to engage with. So a couple of thoughts from me about what I think the um, some of the significant things in the IPCC which have been shaped by David's influence. The first is the making it clear to the global climate community, um, including um, the IPCC, the global adaptation efforts require engaging meaningfully with low income urban residents and their collective organisations and with local and municipal governments, particularly in low and middle income countries. And a lot has been achieved on this, but it's still a, an, an ongoing effort. And I think um, Deborah, uh, Anna and I, who were at the scoping meeting, will probably all feel um, that these things slip down the agenda and we're constantly needing to, um, to promote them. But secondly, um, and outside the climate community, I think David's been instrumental in making sure that the global poverty and urban development community realise that climate change matters to them as well. And it's not been done through uh, you know, banging a hammer or drum too loudly. It's been through a consistent and ongoing engagement and consistent and ongoing explanation of where and why and in what ways um, this new um, what, what was a new agenda really matters. A third is the support for a generation of appropriate and peer reviewed evidence on climate change, poverty and urbanization. In the IPCC, the gold standard is that we draw on peer reviewed academic literature. Um, and I think having this empirical basis for policy making, as we've talked about through environment and urbanization and other spaces, has been important. And I think has also laid a foundation for a lot of the discussions we have now about the significance of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge um, as a basis for the IPCC as well. And finally, I think um, David's been significant in bringing different voices to the IPCC academics from underrepresented regions, younger scholars, and non-academics. So Mark's here in the room with us, and uh, Mark um, Pelling, when we started discussing this session, you mentioned that David had made it clear, quote, that cities matter to the IPCC. Can you talk a bit about how he did this and, and why it's important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. And first, first of all, David S. Let me say uh, what a pleasure it is to be here with you and, and colleagues and share, sharing this moment, celebrating your contributions as they continue and the legacy. So, so thank you. It's a, it's a humbling experience as well. Um, and maybe just a little prelude to responding to the question, David, but keeping, keeping to time and, and, and listening to the, 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 the colleagues who've already spoken. I think what has really made the difference to to me and colleagues is David's inversion of the normal role of an academic scientist which very easily falls into the use of theory to dominate evidence and experience that others have collected and in its worst form to promote the individual to promote the academic standing and presence and ability to shape the field my experience David has been that you take a completely different approach. And you did that in your comment before the break uh, when you were celebrating Shack and Sun dwellers, not celebrating your analysis, but celebrating 
their work leading to uh, a finding that you bring to it. So it's that enabling of other people's ideas and experience that you bring, which is really quite a radical approach to engaging with knowledge, production, sharing. So, so thank you for that. Um, as, a, as a young scholar, the, there were two things that changed my direction and brought me into this circle for good or bad. One of them was Squatter Citizen, landmark text that just opened the possibility of working on social justice, environment and cities. And the other was environment and urbanization. Um, one was, if you like, the gateway drug, and then you mainline <laughs> on environment and urbanization. Um, but I, I remember as well, David, um, the first time I met you, I'm sure you don't remember this, it was University of Liverpool, a seminar, and you spoke in the open uh, discussion, mentioned my name as an author uh, in environment and urbanization, a member of the environment and urbanization family. Um, and on the discussion went, but for a, you know, somebody studying their PhD, that recognition from somebody who's at the top of a field uh, really may, makes a, a tremendous difference in terms of confidence and, uh, and responsibility as well. And that sense of not being a lone scholar, uh, but part of a community of practice. So I, I say those things by way of thanks, but also because that, that way of working is very useful in the IPCC, which is uh, many things, but if one, and, and Deborah, David and Aaron know this better than me or may have different views, but if you want to affect change in the IPCC, which you've done and David has demonstrated this, you need, you need some, some particular skills and approaches and they have to come quite naturally. They have to be quite true, I think, in order to, to bring people with you. <coughs> So I just I just close on on those those four contributions. One one and you do this always so well is a command, like a soft command of the data. So you bring a command of the quantitative data, which does motivate particular parts of the IPCC and science policy life in general. You drop in key facts, evidence is there right at the front. But you don't then cover that in jargon or use it to you know expound a theory you are jargon free the data is there for others to interpret so it's that lack of lack of falling into the trap of bringing data the command bringing jargon the command of the data and, and with that comes a, a sort of soft passion as well so it's not a passion that is uh, domineering but one which is infectious uh, so thank you for that. And then finally, going back to this, this first point about uh, enabling, it's the ability to, to listen. And that is so important in the IPCC, where you have so many uh, you know, national, cultural, discipline, disciplinary, career stage, strong personalities. My experience is that if one wants to make change, it's about building relationships, enabling a narrative to grow through others seeing that narrative rather than you know thrusting it upon them so you you were holding the urban basket through those those years as david said where the literature was was emergent um, and now it now it's mushroomed and thank you thank you for that and it, you you can see how important it was to have someone from iad there in the room someone who'd worked with Barbara Ward, of course, and really got the connection of environment and development, that these, these are two parts of the same. Um, uh, if not, there's always the danger in the IPCC that it becomes dominated by a naturalistic physical science approach, which leads one to technological solutions and the human experience of <coughs> governance, and David spoke to this, gets gets marginalized and and that didn't happen right from the beginning and we see the fruits of that that now so yeah thank you thank you thanks mac and we'll move on to to deborah who has said and i quote that david was central in opening the global climate change conversation to local and unconventional voices and that this is even more critical now than ever before would you like to tell us deborah what you mean by this, and particularly in the context of the IPCC? 
So thanks, David D. And David S., wonderful to be with you, if only virtually to celebrate the enormous impact uh, you've had at a global and, and local level. And I think you've heard from many, and I will repeat it, I think one of your superpowers, and you have many superpowers, um, is that you make people feel seen and heard. And like Mark, I'll just quickly recap my first interaction with you. It was a voice on the end of a phone call from Cape Town. Um, and that's always very odd because those of us in Durban as a, a secondary city in South Africa are generally overlooked by visiting academics. But there was this voice who was urgently seeking a place in my diary to come and meet with me in Durban. And lo and behold, he arrived. And unlike the many other academics who were uh, surging through my office at the time, it was a person who actually listened to what I had to say. So I think that ability to make people seen uh, and heard is, is such an important superpower. And I, I thank you for, for that. Of all the academics who've, who've come through my, my office as a local government practitioner, I would say 99% of them eventually land on waffling on about some uh, theory of, of change. The thing that made you different, David, is that you embraced both the theory but you were also the agent of change. I mean, you're a profoundly well-respected academic, but in my eyes, you're also a very credible uh, activist for, for change. And we've seen that very strongly in, in the IPCC, uh, the work that you and Karen Sito did in the scoping for the fifth assessment report, really heralding in a new focus on urban areas in, in the IPCC is now legend and as David D indicated was even referred to it at the scoping meeting that we both attended in Riga uh, last month. Um, and that championing continued into the production of, of the fifth assessment report. Your ability to link theory with action, as Gautam indicated, meant that you approached me and said, look, you know, there's this chapter, but I need someone who knows how cities work. Um, and I was quite perplexed because as someone who is trained as an academic but had spent most of my career as a local government official, the last place I imagined I would end up would be in the IPCC. And I said, look, this is impossible. There's no way I'll get nominated. My government won't nominate me. And he gets this twinkle in his eyes, David, you definitely do. And he said, leave it to me. And suddenly, mysteriously, this invitation that arrived uh, to join the, the, the urban chapter of, of the fifth assessment report. That was significant, I think, at a number of levels. I never encountered another local government official during the course, course of the fifth assessment cycle. There may have been one or two hidden away in dark corners and other working groups, but I think it did set a precedent to have a practitioner openly included in an author team. I think that was significant. I think it contributed very much to our chapter having a strong focus on nature-based solutions, which weren't a priority at the time, but because of the local work we were doing, that was something I was championing. It was picked up very strongly and I think has become a key message now throughout the discussions around climate change and cities. But probably even more importantly than that, David created an environment in our chapter team, which was so welcoming of all of our different skills, of all of our different inputs. It was a truly empowering thing to be a part of that, that urban chapter team. And that's something I took with me when I was elected as co-chair of Working Group 2 in the sixth assessment cycle, the first local government official to be elected, the first woman from Africa, the first practitioner. And I think that's purely because the spotlight that David uh, shone on me, uh, reflected back to my government who said, who's the strange South African who's busy with the IPCC? We need someone who knows something about policy, so let's nominate her uh, as a co-chair. So I believe there's a direct line between David's inclusion of myself in, in the chapter team and my election as co-chair. But what I took to, to that role, obviously, was to continue the, the work that David had started uh, in championing uh, urban issues. Um, that made uh, the support of the special port proposal by South, the South African government a, a very easy task. We rallied around that. We got agreement to that special report. There were a variety of co-sponsored meetings in support of that special report that were held. But probably the most important legacy was that welcoming inclusive approach to the IPCC work that I took to my role as, as co-chair, really looking to strengthen and support the Global South voice. Um, and there's certainly been commentary about that. There was a change 
uh, during the course of the six assessment cycle, but also welcoming in practitioners more to, to the author teams. I mean, we even had local government officials in the special report on ocean and cryosphere, probably one of the most um, you know, obscure of the IPCC's uh, products, in order to bring that reality uh, to, to bear. So, David, I think you've had an enormous impact because I think because of the work that we did based on your work in, in AR5, uh, continued in, in AR6, we got the special report uh, prepared. For the first time at the scoping meeting in Riga last month, there were eight urban local government officials in the room. They were convened as a panel to provide input into the scoping uh, process. They were acknowledged as true uh, knowledge holders in their own right outside of academia. And that I, I purely lay at your feet. It's, it's because of the value chain you've created. So in many ways, I think about you as having this enormous superpower of inclusion across theory, across practice, as being a credible activist. But you're like a pebble in a pond, and Mark said that so well. You've got this gentle approach to your leadership. You sort of come in as a pebble, create gentle ripples, but by the time they get to the shore, they're a tidal wave of change. And I thank you for that. You've been an enormous influence in my life, um, and through your work, you will continue, and you can see in the comments received, you will continue to influence hundreds and thousands of us still to continue the good fight. Great. Thank you very much, Deborah. I don't think you're actually in front of the Victoria Falls, but our next speaker is actually in the Himalayas, and that's creating some connection um, challenges. Arama, I don't know if we can um, highlight you to see if you are there. Arama um, Revi. Um, Hi, David. David, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, Arrow, and so maybe it's better that we just hear your voice rather than attempt to see your... Um, to see no, your apologies. Voice. You won't be able to see me. I'm on top of a mountain in a monastery, within okay. distance of the Tibetan border. So, and I have fifteen percent left on my battery. So I'll be short. Okay. Um, so if yeah, that, so. that manages to keep you to time, that's fantastic, Arima. <laughs> and we'd be very happy to hear your reflections. <laughs> Thanks, David. So, uh, well, you know, David Sarasvet is not only an institution. He's, I guess, um, he's a polymath, but he's more than a polymath. He's a polymath who's an activist and who has done, I think, more than many people that I, I've known over the last uh, 35, 40 years that I've had the privilege of being a friend, a colleague, a co-conspirator, uh, in actually bringing together not only the words of uh, of the worlds of policy and practice, like Deborah just said, but actually the lives of everyday people, because I think that is the most important thing that we actually currently miss in the IPCC. We've got um, scientists, we've got people who pretend to do uh, policy and practice like me and a few others we have people from 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 local governments but we really still as yet don't actually have the voice of uh, the squatter citizen or um you know the, the people who actually are are making things happen especially on adaptation and by uh, consuming less i would say or emitting less on, on the mitigation side so you know i think that's that's a sort of um th that's a gap that we need to fill i'm not sure that we'll be able to do that in the r7 but like many of us said, um, the fact that we've got this far in the IPCC uh, over, this, over these many years really uh, it can be linked back to not only what happened in AR5 and 6, but actually maybe 50 years ago. Uh, from my own conversations and the many times that you know he shares experiences with me, uh, David's experiences starting in the 70s uh, have actually been not only formative for him, but have actually in some ways changed uh, many, many things across the world. Um, starting with, of course, sitting cats with Barbara Ward and working with her, uh, but also Habitat One. I would imagine that Habitat One would not have taken the turn that it took uh, of being inclusive of civil society, of actually changing the the progress and the sort of perspective of national governments uh, without the seminal sort of contributions that he made to bring all of that stuff together in 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 seventy six. Uh, then going on much later to Habitat Two, um, and the number of critical sort of analytical reports that he produced for a whole range of uh, international agencies, whether it's UN Habitat, of course, at, at that point of time, UN CHS, the main Habitat 2 report, ba basically building this arc in which um, the urban ceased to become invisible at one level, that's for academics and people who are in the policy space, but more important, the everyday lives uh, of poor and vulnerable people across the world uh, became much more visible and, and very active. And then, you know, the 
the orientation that came, especially from environment and urbanization, of the voice of practitioners of communities uh, to you know to speak of their experiences and actually and make that legitimate knowledge as I think dramatically shifted both perception and practice and of course policy in in many parts of the world. So I think that long arc is is really important and you know for some of us who have not had the privilege of being as patient as David has, it takes sometimes a generation or two to be able to shift these systems in ways that you couldn't sort of have imagined. And in some senses, we're almost back to the poly crisis of the 70s and uh, the crisis of the first, you know, uh, oil, you know, the oil crisis and things that emerged in the 70s almost 50 years later just now. And David, in a sense, uh, both in his, in his work and in the major, uh, you know, battles that he's fought on behalf of a whole range of different actors, I think optimizes that kind of process. So the science is important. Uh, you know, he's... Uh, he's had some dramatic influences on on what I've been able to do myself. There was an article that he really worked with me very hard uh, in the early 2000s, which kind of has now become a pretty well cited in, in almost a thousand citations or so, uh, uh, which in a sense tried to bring together the idea that mitigation adaptation and disaster risk reduction could be implemented simultaneously, which in some sense is almost, uh, I guess, 15, 20 years before it actually happened was the foundations of what we now call climate resilient development in, in, in many ways. So he's really tried to push many of us, and I think his personal contributions and many other colleagues who are part of the ENU process of bringing the voice of practitioners and people who actually know what's happening but don't have the time or the energy to be able to write have been very, very critical. And then he managed to con me uh, to, to sort of set up uh, a similar kind of journal um, um, many, many years ago, we tried to build something out of ENU Asia that didn't really happen. So we, we created urbanization and it was a great privilege uh, to be able to be sort of guided and mentored through that process of establishing a journal focused on the global south by somebody who had been practicing that uh, with Hardoy um, and with so many other people for, I would say, a generation um, and a half. So it's been a great and tremendous pressure. We've shared a lot of ups and downs, including difficult times that he's had and he's sort of handled with great courage, determination and the you know the willingness of never giving up uh, as you can hear from him in his blog that comes out you know every every so often. So it's been a great pleasure and as I must say I, I guess you know I hope uh, we are very honored at IHS because for better or for worse David has chosen uh, to park his archives and his personal papers with us. Uh, and a lot of his wonderful collection that's to fill, you know, from the bottom to the top of his room uh, in the old, old Enslitz uh, uh, street office of IAD. Uh, we now have it with us. In fact, my, my colleagues that are befuddled because many of them were never born. And when they pick up notes and, and you know, typewritten uh, minutes from 1972 and 73, some of them have never seen a typewriter before. So it's a real pleasure and a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to host that kind of process. And in some senses, hopefully... Uh, be able to do build on and make 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 his legacy and his work accessible to a wide range of people who are trying to uh, run through the similar kind kind of journeys in in other parts of the world. So it's it's been a great pleasure, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aramar. And we are out of time for this session. I need to steal just thirty seconds more to mention one name of someone who I know would have very much wanted to speak to David's work in the IPCC, and who we all miss very dearly, which is Salim Al Haq. Um, and then Salim and David working together from IIED on the IPCC was um, so massively important for the IPCC. And on a very personal note, working with Salim and David at a very significant time in my own career was the, the single most significant uh, opportunity and influence on my professional life. But hopefully also on the way um, I've approached working with other people, I think as, um, as Mark said very clear, Mark and Deborah, pointed out. David has realized that you do good work by being kind and generous and inclusive. So many people stop being kind and generous and inclusive at difficult times. And David has done good work by being kind and generous and inclusive. And thank you for being part of my own life, David. Thank you to David D for that and to our colleagues online in the room. And our final session, I'm going to turn it to my other colleague, Anna Walnicki. Who's principal researcher at IID? 
and you can discuss with group uh, for our session on partnerships with grassroots organizations and federations of the urban poor. Over to you, Anna. Thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, I was hired by David and Diana about a decade ago, and their dedication to collaboration with grassroots organisations around critical issues like urban poverty, health and climate change was and continues to be central to the way that I and others in the Human Settlements Group continue to work today. So with that in mind, it's a real honour to be chairing a session with this wonderful panel of guests and friends of David, um, who've worked closely together over the years in partnership with communities and grassroots organisations. Um, this session will specifically reflect on the experiences and aspirations of grassroots organisations and federations of the urban poor that have been driving up grazing processes in cities in lo low middle income nations over the last 30 years. So I'd like to welcome our panel. Uh, we have Ho Ho Ardoy, who is a senior researcher at IID America Latina in Buenos Aires, Ar Argentina. Her father, Jorge, worked closely with David to set up an urban research programme that would become um, IID's Human Settlements Group. We have uh, Joseph Maturi, who's the president of the Global Sun Dwellers International um, Network and chairs the SDI board. Um, we were meant to have some Suk Bunyavancha, who's chairperson of ACHR, but she's running late from a meeting. So fortunately, Sheila, who is the founder of SPARC, the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centres, um, is going to jump in at the last minute. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all. Um, we've got two quick, we're, we're going to sort of discuss two uh, things that we've been kind of exploring over the last couple of weeks. Firstly, I'm going to invite the panellists to reflect on their specific experiences of working alongside David with grassroots organisations and federations to promote upgrading and informal settlements. Um, and I'm going to start by um, inviting Ho Ho. Hi, everyone. Um, well, David, it's a pleasure to be virtually with you. Uh, hopefully I saw you last year. Uh, we have a, a notion across, uh, but uh, it's very nice being here. Um, as most of the people around here, you know that uh, IID America Latina started as part of IID in London with David, and it moved from a research organization to a, a, a more action research oriented organization. And in that process, we build these long-term partnerships Anna was mentioning with community organizations and local governments. And David has been a key player in supporting the process all along for many, many years. And much of David's DNA is sort of embedded in what we are doing and how we do it. Um, during the, the conversations this morning, like many of you mentioned, and I would like to point to a few aspects that we sort of sort of value with within IID America Latina and have a lot to do with what uh, David uh, is. One is this uh, curiosity to 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 work the curiosity to work with people, to listen, to learn and connect themes. David has been connecting uh, I think like uh, Diana mentioned earlier uh, issues that were not so obvious at that time. So for example, uh, working with uh, development issues, connecting it to disaster risk, climate action, uh, and, and how this would make a, a better transformation of, of cities. And, um, and so this has been a driver to us and that we've tried to, to do it, not, not, not always in the best possible ways, but this has been a sort of a core in our work to, to try to connect thing, themes and people to, to bring about the transformations we needed. Um, another point is this uh, push that David always asked us to write and to, to put our work in paper so that we could share it and others would, we could all learn from it. And he has been supporting not only practitioners, but also lo local government officials and, and community organizations to, with funds to, to have time to write and, and, and reflect about the work we do. And then another issue that has been very core to what David has done with us is 
to access funds in the most flexible way possible. Uh, usually, it's uh, funds come with very strict, narrow uh, scopes, and it's very difficult to to have the flexibility to to work with in in the ground uh, with fun, funds that are so unflexible in many ways. And David has always been pushing that those funds need to be more flexible and and trying to have. Uh, reach different funds that we could do the work we would like to do and how we like to do it, not with so many conditions. And I think that all those aspects are have been all along been very much tied to the type of work we do. And they are all very much tied to David, his history of work. So uh, thank you very much, David. Thanks, Hoho. Um, I'd now like to invite Joe to reflect a little bit on, on his experiences. Please have the floor. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the network, uh, thank you very much for ID for um, having us here. And I'm very humbled uh, on behalf of the SDI network to speak about um, uh, a great uh, person. But specifically, I would like to speak um, about um, the kind of friendship uh, that David shared with my predecessor, uh, Jokin, all of you are aware. So one of the things, uh, because I'm one of the lucky few people who spent uh, uh, time with Jokin uh, before he passed on, and uh, the way he spoke about David, all of you are aware, uh, David, had uh, Jokin had very little, little time for professionals and academics, especially from the global north, and in particular uh, from the UK. <laughs> but Jokin adored David, and through him came to love his frequent visit to London, where the two could spend uh, many hours in an animated conversation. I remember the last time Sheila, you and I, and uh, Jokin were, David, you hosted us, uh, in your house, um, and Sheila cooked for us very spicy, spicy chicken. Uh, so I think about the work uh, to David and what it means uh, to slum dwellers and to the urban poor uh, is self-evident uh, in his essays, the papers, the research work he has done on federation and the urban poor. In general, he means that he has a deeply embedded uh, pattern for the wise and the respected in the SDA family. It is a great honor for me uh, on behalf of the network to pay tribute to such a wonderful man. Uh, and I think uh, I also in my work, I interacted, I have a book and I think I was inspired by your work. David, when I was in your house, you gave me a book um, and you signed the book for me. And I think uh, over the years, I've deep to dive just to understand urban poverty, to understand housing, uh, to understand, um, uh, development, and I think uh, I thank you for that. And I think uh, on behalf of the SDN network, we are grateful and deeply in indebted to be part of this. And I'm very uh, grateful and humbled to be your friend. Thank you very much, David. Thanks so much, Joe. Sheila, you have the floor. Well, I get to speak twice. I see. <laughs> <laughs> So David, I'm so sorry that I haven't been present physically. But you know, this 50 year business is so much a part of our lives. You've been doing this for 50 years, so have I. I got married in 74, I started working in 74. And so it's uh, this, this, this year is full of very important milestones. But I, uh, so, David, Samsuk, and I are more or less around the same age. And we have this similar history of just working on the issues. We started doing it accidentally, but we have become professionals who support community processes. So Samsuk does that, I do that. And I met Samsuk uh, in Delhi and in Mumbai after David and others in the Habitat International Coalition uh, decided to start the Asian Coalition of Housing Rights. And we were 11 organizations from some 
seven countries who in 1986 or 87 started ACHR. And what we did was collectively challenged all the theorization on the basis of which development investment came to us. And for us, uh, David's presence in our lives as social movements, first as ACHR and then as STI, was that there was a absolutely new voice telling us that what our experiences as Southern professionals working with community brought to light was the right thing to fight for and not to get intimidated by all these PhDs and postgrads and God knows who all from the North came with their projects and their proposals and our right to say, this is not what people need. And so through the lives of ACHR and SDI, IID and David have played a very critical role in assisting us directly in justification of what we wanted to do. But interestingly, assisting and supporting us to meet all the mayors that we used to love to hate, to meet all the funding organizations who would piss us off because of the rules and regulations and procurement systems that they pushed on us and produced a process in which we spoke to each other. And I would love IID to start doing that again for this new generation because we learned a lot from that. But as Sherry and others were speaking, David's contribution for forcing all of us to write is the proof of how we all have begun to see the doing and the writing together. And in many instances, it has even taught us how to fight with other journals who in their editing change everything we say into something else. And we say, environment and urbanization doesn't do that. So let's go back to this. And I think that our transition, my personal and both ACHR and SDI's transition to acknowledging the, the, the co-production of new development and climate-linked investment came out of these dialogues with David. Because first we'd say, oh, everybody's talking about mitigation. What do we have to do with it? Everybody's talking about the ozone layer. And he says, you guys are in charge of the brown agenda. Forget the blue agenda, forget the green agenda. You're the brown agenda. So we became the brown agenda. We began to look at everything we did in that way. And I gave him and through him, my relationship with Salim, who Lucy and David spoke about, contributed hugely to help me make this transition to look at development and climate change as critical elements that had to be together. And for us to look at the value of the evidence that we produce for this process. So for all of us, and this is a big, big, important milestone, uh, David continues to check on us and see whether we still have an appetite to write about this or that. Can we participate in writing blogs? And we do that. And for all of us, the most important element of what David did in IID, and I think David Dodman uh, remembers that, that uh, many of the new people who came to work in IID had to come and visit at least three federations. It was like a trial by fire. Can you get along with them? Do you find that they can tell you something? Do you honor the work that they do? And for us, that was a very important part of expanding our relationship, both as ACHR and with uh, uh, and STI. And the last thing I want to say is, it was a very interesting situation where a lot of the large volumes of money that ACHR and STI got were rooted through IID in a process of trust and partnership in which the Human Settlements Group and David and his colleagues all participated in equalizing those relationships. So David, 
big legacy, big demands and expectations on your group, but we'll keep the pressure on. Back to you, Anna. Thanks so much, Sheila, and for stepping in at the last minute. Um, so we're running out of time, but I just wanted to give all three panellists um, an opportunity, looking to the future, to reflect a little bit on how we might increase the scale, scope and effectiveness of the work we've been talking about today, particularly in light of the future risks that are posed by climate change. So you've each got a minute or two each just to reflect on what you what our future priorities are and, and should continue to be. I'll hand back to you, uh, Ho-Ho. Well, I think I'm quite practical. So uh, I think there's a Right now, we are doing a project which which Anna is involved, uh, which is called Transformative Urban Coalitions. And I think how I look forward of in in work and how I think we should be working. This project has and it's been uh, it has a lot of uh, we managed to get funds to do practical things in the ground with the community and the local government. And I think of oh, it's quite obvious, but that is a way to go. Which, but in fact, it's usually quite hard because it's very difficult to get the funds to actually be implementing. And as we say in Spanish, aprender haciendo, learn by doing, if it's the right translation. And and this has to do a lot with um, the trust, but because the consortium wasn't really doing that. We just managed to pull our part in Buenos Aires to do that. And it has to do with IIDs believe in that's the way forward too and usually and, and a lot of David's uh, imprint in that kind of work that values doing things learning by doing it not just theorizing or or, or doing great projects that afterwards they never get implemented so I think the way forward is getting the different voices and different people to get to discuss and get together and actually do things and learn by doing them. And then we can register and, and write about it and, and, and show how it can be done and share between each other. But uh, I think that trust of being able to do things and, and, and let it go and be flexible on how it's done, I think it's the way forward actually to, to be more transformative. Thanks so much, Ho-Ho. Um, Joe, any reflections? Yeah, I think so far, I, I, I think uh, SDI's relationship and partnership collaboration uh, has been amazing, but I think looking forward in the future, uh, a lot of communities, uh, when it comes to climate change issues, when it comes to resilience issues, so many of you are aware of the devastating floods that have left um, uh, thousands homeless in Madare, uh, and I think uh, looking forward, looking in the future, the way we want to uh, probably collaborate is also to amplify, uh, continue amplifying the voices uh, of the urban poor, uh, the work they are doing on the ground, the resilience work. Uh, and one of the things that uh, Kemani keep on uh, challenging uh, research organizations, uh, there's a lot of publication, there's a lot of extraction for, uh, of knowledge uh, from communities and they do not get uh, the credit they deserve. And I think Emani has been challenging uh, researchers, academia. Uh, you also need um, anything that, that uh, we contribute when it, we publish, when IID publishes. Uh, we have been, uh, hopefully in the future, you also get to uh, have rights as authors, as co-authors of those publications. But so far, we are looking forward to continue with the partnership, the collaboration, amplifying community voices, amplifying the work on the ground, uh, amplifying uh, community struggles, the urban poor struggles, and the resilience and the efforts and the work they are doing when it comes to uh, uh, the fighting for secure tenure, uh, fighting for affordable houses, and just basic services uh, in, in, in cities. Thank you. And to continue the work uh, specifically uh, in the climate space, uh, this is a space that uh, uh, a lot of um, countries in Africa are struggling. And for us, um, we have been in the last uh, 
few years uh, been pushing for just connecting um, uh, climate change, the effects specifically on the urban poor, connecting climate change uh, with housing, with services. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And Sheila, the last few reflections on, on future priorities. I the, uh, you know, the work that IID has done on, uh, you know, on money where it matters needs to be taken up much more vigorously now than ever before. Because the resources, especially in the cities, are not coming to poor communities. And what we go and SDI and ACHR and all the other networks of grassroots communities have shown that you need to develop an architecture of delivery, monitoring, evaluation, scale through these institutional arrangements. And IID is very, very well uh, placed to do these things, but I don't think we're doing it as aggressively as we should or making using this long partnership enough to do. And for me, the most important thing, again, because you're talking about environment and development, is that there cannot be any development anymore that does not have climate science behind it. And cities are not doing that. Mayors are not doing that. Everybody's talking. So you have in these grassroots networks, huge aggregations to collect evidence, to produce new knowledge, to explore new practices. And I think we have to do it much more aggressively and in a focused way than we do. And the same goes for many of the other things that we can do, because you're very well placed to work in all the three southern continents. A big job. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sheila, and Ho Ho, and to Joe. Um, that draws a close to this panel. I'm going to hand back to Lucy now. Thank you, um, Anna and colleagues, um, and particularly to, to Sheila for talking about a big job we have on our hands, and will continue. Uh, in the last few moments, I want to hand over to David for the, to, to take the, the last word. So David, mm. the floor is yours. Joseph said, connecting climate change to housing basic services. Absolutely right. I'm amazed as to when you do an analysis of I the do. risk reduction the nice house with basic services provides, but how much of it is also the basis for withstanding increased level of risk and vulnerabilities. And the climate change adaptation must never take over or push out the the housing, the water, the sanitation, the drainage, the healthcare, the schools, the, law, the rule of law, community management, all that stuff is really good for, them, for climate change adaptation, but it's done to meet development needs. Everyone says we've got to go to scale, we've got to go to scale, but it's absolutely right. But there are some amazing examples that have gone to scale. We, we, we look with awe at what they do in Nairobi. The, complexities of working in so many informal settlements, dealing with hundreds of thousands, so that's where we're getting the scale. SUMSO, the Community Organisation Development Institute, I think 500,000 people reached. How do we change the availability of funding and who controls it? And what we ideally need is funds in every city to which the donors can provide the funding, but then all the decisions about management and priority um, are not possible. And uh, the intermediate institutions that sit the, between the, the big donor money and work on the ground, we haven't done enough work on them. Final comment. This is. Um, Jorge Ardoy's um, wonderful comment. He was asked, um, do you think you have any impact, your work? I, you're asking one of the most well-known and highly <coughs> regarded human settlement specialists in Latin America. And he said, no, we don't have any impact individually. But we have impact collectively. Well, what? This 
this part I thank you for the richness and the wonder of this event, especially this people. And I hope our voice part also got there that um, collectively we have impact. So let's go out and impact a bit more. I also cry when Jockin's name is mentioned and at my daughter's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Good readings. Thank you, David, so much. Uh, thank you to everybody online and the wonderful comments you've been posting. We are going to say goodbye from the room now, but we're going to leave the chat open for about 10 minutes so you can carry on adding your comments. And we'll also provide an email there for you to write to us with your, send us your photos and your memories. But thank you again. Um, I, it's been a wonderful, wonderful morning here. I hope it's been a wonderful afternoon, evening where you are as well. And uh, we're now going to raise a toast to, to David. So if it's if it's an appropriate hour where you are, please raise a toast to David. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.